All right, hey, welcome to another episode of Coach P's Perspective. Uh, today, man, I am pumped. I've got a good friend of mine, absolute monster athlete, Bobby Lashley. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about Bobby for those who don't know him. If you're listening to this via podcast, we'll also have it on YouTube because uh, he's a specimen to look at as well. All right, so, but Bobby is from uh, Junction City, Kansas. So I teach and coach in Kansas. I actually met Bobby whenever we wrestled together in college over in Missouri, but he's from JC as a three-time college national champion wrestler, an absolute stud. And I can tell you from experience watching him, uh, just, just woke up on a lot of guys, but he also has the work ethic and uh, to back it up, right? Talented, but he also put in work and I got to see that firsthand. It's part of the Army uh, world-class elite athlete program. So, you know, competing internationally for us. Went on to MMA and then right now, man, he's in the WWE a uh, superstar in that. The, as far as I know, am I correct, Bobby? You are the U.S. champion right now. Yes, I am. United yeah. States champion. Awesome, man. That's great. So that's just a little bit of background. I'll have all that stuff in the show notes as well. But thanks for being on, man. I appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure, man. Yep. So well, let's do this for those who maybe don't know you, or at least I mean, don't know you intimately. Give us some of your background, man, just growing up and then how you got into sports because you're a great athlete and we have a lot of athletes or coaches that listen to this. So a little bit about your background. Oh, wow. Um, dang, man, this, this podcast can go on for days uh, with, with things that I can talk to you about, some things I'm going to pick up from you. Just our days also training and, and wrestling together at Valley. But for me, uh, my dad was in the Army, so we were all over the place. I was born in North Carolina. Um, Went to Germany for a little while, ended up in Junction City, Kansas. Went to high school there. And my freshman year, I, I wrestled varsity. I was, a, I was an athlete, a very athletic kid, but I was really, really small. I didn't hit a growth spurt until like college and into the Olympic Training Center. So my first year at Junction City High, I, I wrestled at 112. I was starting at 112. Then I went up to my sophomore year, I hit like a weird growth spurt where I went. 119, 125, 130, and 135 all in the same season. So my coach just got fed up with me jumping from weight class to weight class. So, um, and I kept running into really tough people on our team. So I ended up wrestling um, JV that year. And I mean, it was a good year for me. It was a good learning year for me. I went undefeated on JV, which, you know, it is what it is, but it gave me an opportunity to kind of get hungry. And then I went to some different camps and stuff like that. And then um, over that year, that summer, that's when I really kind of like things start clicking a little bit. So my junior year, I ended up taking second at state, and then I won state my senior year. Then I went on to Valley, and when I went to Valley, it was just getting thrown into a den with a bunch of wolves. I mean, you know how it is. Yeah. When we were up there, you know, it, I think um, – just having the ability to wrestle with a lot of the guys and just being on a very successful team like that kind of like changed my um, thought process and a lot of different things. But um, end up winning, taking fourth as a freshman and then winning nationals my sophomore, junior, senior year. After that, I went out to, um, after, after college, I was going to give it all up. I was going to quit, um, just work a regular job. I had my degrees. So I was like, well, you know, just go up to um, St. Louis and I was down there with Joe Preci at the time, mm -hmm. and I got a job as a sports coordinator for the city of Wolf Allen, which I just, that was it. I was just going to be like the regular Joe. I was like, man, I, I put in too much. You know how it is with wrestling. At some point in time, you're like, when is it time to call it quits? And at that time, I was like, I think it's, it's about that time. Then like a year after um, been, I've been there, um, Mockles called me up, and he was like, hey, um, I got tickets to the U.S. Open. You want to come? It's in Vegas. You know, all you got to do is get a flight. And I was working. I was like, of course, I want to see how everybody's doing. Good tournament to go to and Vegas. Go over there and have a good time. So we flew over there and um, right, scratch that before that. We were going to fly over there. And then he calls me back a couple hours later. He's like, hey, why don't you wrestle in it? I was like, man, I'm not wrestling the U.S. Open. I hadn't even practiced for an entire year. I'm already in the regular Joe status of just taking it easy. And uh, Michael's like, come on, come on, man. You, you can get ready. You can get ready. I was like, all right, when is it? It's in two weeks. So I, I started, I ran down to like the local high school and I was like wrestling with some guys there in practice and getting ready. And, and then we went down there 
and made weight. Um, I think that was a big part of it was just cutting the weight. So I made weight and I had a good tournament for not even wrestling for an entire year. And I think I ran into Hartung and me and Hartung had a battle. And I think um, he ended up winning like four to two. But this is the guy that was training full time, preparing for it at the training center and everything. And um, he beat me by two points and it was a pretty tough match, but I was dead tired. I was dead tired. Um, so at that point, Mockles was like, hey, man, you need to really think about continuing on, you know, to Olympics or whatever it is. I mean, you have a gift, you have a talent and um, you have something. So he said, you should really think about doing it. So he contacted me with the army coach. Long story short, I ended up joining the army, which is a crazy story in itself. Um, I went into the army right around the time that the Twin Towers went down. So I went from going into the army to wrestle to possibly having a chance of going to war just based on the situation. But anyway, they let me back, uh, let, let me um, go through to the, to the program. Went up to Fort Carson, won armed forces a couple of times, took second at the military world championships. So I have a silver medal at the world championships. And um, then after that, um, it was a year before the Olympics. So it was in 2003, went to the world team trials. I took third at the world team trials, had a pretty good showing. I just moved up in weight class, just set myself in a weight class that I didn't have to cut too much weight, that I could actually be healthy and ready to go. And um, that summer, I was at a bank, um, about to put some money in the bank, and these guys came out of nowhere, kicked the door down. The guy took a shot. I was standing in the back of the line. He shot right at the back of my head. I like moved to the side. The bullet went through here. I took a dive down to the ground. Um, that ended my amateur wrestling career. I was completely done at that time um, because I split my knee open, and they had to go through surgery, and it, it, it was crazy. So the, what the doctor was telling me is, I had to have surgery and I was going to have to have a, at least a six month recovery and nationals was in eight months. So for me, I was like, all right, let's do it. And we could possibly just rush through this. Maybe have three months to prepare and actually still go to the open. So I was like, all right, went through the surgery. About a month after I had the surgery, started getting really bad infections in my knees. Then I had to go back into surgery like a month later. I think they left something in my knee or something happened, but they had to cut me open again. Now we're like closer to the time. I think it was like five months away and I was just going into surgery. So at that point, reality kind of sat in and I was like, well, um, didn't know what I was going to do. And I don't even know how this happened. <laughs> just out of the blue, I was sitting down on my couch and I was just like laying there and I was just praying. I was like, what next? I was like, after everything that I went through, everything gets shut because these guys came shooting up a bank. Mm -hmm. And so, um, they got to know where I get a call from this guy. Hey, Bobby, it's Gerald Briscoe with the WWE. We saw you at the couple tournaments. You met Kurt last year. We exchanged information. Uh, we'd be interested in having you come over and do a trial for the WWE. Now, when he was telling me this, I still, had a leg brace on. I hadn't walked for like a couple months. So I kind of like pushed him off and kind of like, I was like, yes, absolutely. Because like one door closed, another door opened. <clears throat> I um, rehabbed like crazy for some time. He gave me about a month to get ready for it. And then, I mean, there's so much more detail in there. I'm just giving the shortened version of all of this. And um, went to the trial and they loved me at the trial. They gave me a contract and that was about 17 years ago now. Oh, wow. And from then, I've been wrestling with WWE. I took a break off, fought for about eight years in the middle of there, and then I did pro wrestling and, and fighting at the same time. And then just recently, about three years ago, I signed all the way back on full-time with the WWE and been there ever since. That's yeah, it's amazing. So one of the things that's so crazy to me is, I mean, wrestling a lot of times is sort of like a microcosm of life. And, mm -hmm. it's, you know, just the highs, the lows, the ups, the downs, the things that you can control and the things that you can't, you know, and so here you, you know, you're, you're a phenomenal college wrestler. 
decide to come back, you put in the training, even joining the army, do all these things, all these sacrifices, and then life just throws something crazy at you. The change is the course, right? Yeah, but like mm-hmm. you said, one door closes, another one opens, you know, and uh, it's tough, man. I mean, I know that, you know, my own wrestling career, and I've seen it multiple times as a coach, when you put so much work in for something and then it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, right? Either by your own volition or something, an outside source, whatever. Um, it's heartbreaking, man. It's cr- But at the same time, it teaches you so many life lessons. So mm-hmm. for you, like going through that and then, you know, just being a long time, great wrestler, did that help you in that situation? All the ups and downs you had to deal with in wrestling when it came down to like, man, like literally my career might be over. Um, and, and even just sitting with an injury for a long time, did your previous experience help you with that? Absolutely. Everything that I've been through, man, I, I came and, and I'll touch on some of my past before, as we go through it, when, when I, uh, when I was growing up, I, I didn't have very much. I didn't have anything. You, and if you know, Junction city, I was like in the hood in Junction city. Yeah. I mean, my mom's house was worth about $12,000. I mean, there was four of us in there. So I came from nothing. So I always knew that the harder I work and I always post this all the time, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Mm-hmm. And I'm the, I'm, I'm the person that it's, I don't even, I don't even see a negative. I don't even see like a, oh no, turn back, look back. When I was going through my career, even, even the, even the time when I was, when, so when I came to the bank, I was walking into this bank. I went to the first part, got some money out of the ATM. And then I got into the back of the line. There was a straight line and then the tellers here. So I got into the back of the line. So I knew and I heard these guys because they kicked the door down. Everybody in front of me was screaming because they could see behind me. I couldn't see anything. I took a look like that and I dove down to the ground. I'm laying down there on the ground. The only thing I kept saying in my head, it's not supposed to end like this. Mm. It's not supposed to end like this. I've never put myself in a situation where I believe that I should be moving the other direction. So even the, even the time when I was rehabbing the whole time, I was thinking, man, I'm going to get, this leg is going to get bionic and I'm, I'm going to be so like, I'm always thinking that something positive is going to happen from whatever negative situation I have. Yeah. And I think that's always put me in a place where positive things happen afterwards. There was a time when I left WWE and I was fighting, didn't really want to fight so much. I just enjoyed fighting and I loved, and I loved competing. But I always wanted to get back into WWE, and there was a time that I wasn't doing anything, like maybe a good year or so. Um, had a little separation with my ex, so I was a single father at that time, had my kids, my time was going crazy, my head was going crazy, and I, I spent a little time where I was like, everything felt like it was going and falling apart. But then I kind of like started putting everything back together, and then I started... Um, training. I was waking up at like five in the morning. I was getting, getting, getting workout in the morning. And then later on, I was, I was training again and people were like, but dang, you're getting in great shape. What are you getting in tra- shape for? I was like, I don't know, but I'm going to be ready when it's time. Yeah. And that's where I've always been. I mean, right now I, I try not to talk about my age so much, but I'm 44 years old in, in the WWE doing stuff that 20 year olds are doing. Yeah. And I feel great right now. And I think that I can do this for another 10, 15 years if I wanted to, I'm not going to, but um, I just always believe that I had something greater for myself and, and I've always trained and, and moved accordingly. Yeah. I think that belief system has, uh, well, I don't just think, I know it has paid off for you, you know, and it's paid dividends and it's continuing to do so. And um, kind of going back to college, man, you know, and I've never even talked to you about this, but I know when I very first came into college, you know, here I'm a freshman and you guys are, you guys had just won a team national title the year before and then we won it the year I was there too. But I walked in and I just kind of had this mindset, you know, when you come from high school and you've kind of been the big dog in your school or whatever, and my dad, yeah. and coach, and, uh, but, but you know, there's gonna be a lot of tough guys. And like you said, it's the wolves den, right? And, but um, yeah. I just made this decision, man, in preseason, I saw you guys, you and Bo Vest and, you know, some of the other guys that were national champions or all Americans. And I just said, like, I'm going to do whatever they do. So whenever we went on team runs, I'm finding an All-American national champion, and I'm going to run beside them. Whenever we're lifting weights, I'm going to lift with them. And then once we got in the room, like, 
a lot of the freshmen wrestled together. Like I jumped in with the older guys, took some beatings for a little bit, but we just decided if there, there's a reason why they're really good and I have to train with them to get to where they are. Cause that's what my goals are. And it worked. Right. So I ended up transferring, but ended up being an all American and it's amazing the next year, like I walked in, I didn't realize how tough I had gotten just wrestling in those groups, man. Like it completely changed me. Oh yeah. But oh yeah, you know, you're one of the guys that, you know, whenever we were lifting, like you'd be lifting weights and I'd be like sneaking over to the side watching you. And I'm like trying to like do whatever you do, you know? And so I was looking up to you a lot whenever I was a freshman and didn't say a lot, you know, I'm like, oh man, that's Bobby Lashley. He's a national champion, but you know, I'm over there trying to do and trying to model. So the way that you, the way that you live your life, not only helps you, but it's an inspiration to those around you as well, which I, I truly appreciate that. Yeah, man. I, I appreciate you saying that also, man, but it, it's, it's true. Cause that's how I've always, I've always, um, I've always thought I used to talk to kids all the time in school. And I, I remember one time I was talking to talking to these kids and I said, I said, um, just let's suppose how who wants to be who who wants to be a professional athlete because they were asking me different questions of how you got to where you where you're at and um I remember this one kid talking he kind of like raises his hand and all the other kids are around him and you could tell that he was the superstar from the school yeah and he was kind of asking me some questions and I was like hey I said who's your favorite favorite player and at the time he said you know I enjoyed Michael Jackson I said do you read his book he goes yeah I said um you remember that time in his book where he said he did like 500 free throws a day or something like that? You know, a lot of people write it. It's kind of crazy. And he was like, yeah. I said, did you do 500 free throws a day? Hmm. And he goes, no, did you do it yesterday? No, did you do it the day before? And what I'm trying to say is like, everybody wants to go to a certain place and they think that there's like this mysterious, like underground cult that you have to walk through to get there. No, I said, you know, there's a map to getting anywhere that anybody wants to get usually it's in a book but you can always find out from someone and then just do what they did and that's at least going to get you as far as they got yeah and then at that point the extra effort can take you further so i said don't try to rush things or look at things blindly there's a lot of people out there that have already been to a lot of the places that you want to get find out what they did and do what they did and then do more so that's all i used to try to I used to try to put that in my, I, I remember in high school, I had this guy in high school as a three time state champion, Brian Briggs. To this day, Brian Briggs has no idea that I'm still talking about him to this day, but he was that impactful on my life. I used to watch this guy as a freshman. He was a senior. I was like, man, this guy is amazing. And I used to see him in practice and I used to see how he would always lead the runs. So, was there like, so this, he was answering all the questions that I had. Yeah. How do you get to where he is? Well, he's winning all the races. When I was at Valley, I didn't care if it was a sprint or long distance. I wanted to try to win. And if I didn't win, it would like almost tear me up inside. In practice, if somebody almost got a takedown on me, it would like rip my heart out, like rip my, like I couldn't eat that night. I was, I was just on a whole different level, but everything mattered to me. And, and I saw this from some of the people. I mean, it wasn't something where I was throwing stuff down and breaking stuff. It was like, man, I have that desire, that will to learn. And I watch these guys and see what these guys are doing. And I want to get there. So I'm going to work as hard, if not harder than. So, I mean, it all goes back to what I said before. The harder I work, the luckier I got. Yeah. I love the way you say that too, man. There's a roadmap because it's so true. You know, um, when I was growing up, I didn't like to read a lot, you know, and then even, even in college, I read where I was assigned. But then I become an adult and I realize like you can't experience enough life on your own. You can experience a lot of things, but man, why not learn from the, from the experience of other people and people who have been there before? If it, you know, I don't care if you're in business, uh, coach, teacher, athlete, whatever it is. If you want to be great at something, find somebody who's been great at it. Like you said, there's a roadmap, see what they did and then try to follow suit. doesn't mean you can't have your own opinion, your own personality, whatever, but do what they do. And even on my own high school team, you know, we've had a lot of state champions and I tell the kids like, Hey, we got a system that works. If you literally follow this system, you're going to put yourself in that position right there. I can't guarantee yeah. it, but you're going to give yourself the best chance. And those who yeah. do over and over put themselves in that exact same position. Yeah. Yeah. And on the runs, I know you were always up there. Cause I was always up there too, man. I was like, 
yeah. trying to do that. So when I transferred schools and ended up wrestling in other schools, same thing, man. I was always trying to be that dude that was up front and leading, you know, it's kind of, yeah. I think I'd always been that way a little bit, but even more is bred into my mind. Like if you're going to be the best in this room, if you're going to be an all American national champion, this is what you do. This is how it's done. So yeah, there's no secret to success. Yeah. There's no secret to success. And I think a lot of people, they, yeah, it's, it's, it's teach its own. Like some people don't want to put it to that level. Some people are, are comfortable somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. it, it's, we need those people, but, yeah. the, but you can't, you can't be comfortable and then want to be up here at the same time. Yeah. I try to tell some people it's, it's cause I asked a buddy of mine, I have a good friend of mine, Dr. Roddy down in, in Florida and my son's 12 and my daughter's nine. And then I have an older daughter that's 16 and I, and, and he has a couple of kids. He was an Olympian. And I said, I said, Roddy, I said, at what time do you start like putting some of these things on your kids? Because I know what it took to get where I, where I, where I made it. At what point do I start forcing on my kids or putting it on my kids? And he was like, ah, he said, you know what? He said, the most important thing I teach my kid is, is I'm not trying to force him into judo because that's where he was an Olympian. He said, he said, what I try to do is I try to teach my kid the grind, teach him how to understand the grind and how to endure the grind and how to overcome the grind. Because once you do that, you can implement that at any point in your life. Yeah. You understand things are going to be a little tough. You can be comfortable when things are tough and then you can overcome those tougher things. He said, so that's, what's important to me. Cause if I don't teach my kid that I'm doing a disservice to them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's wow. where I go with my kids. And that's where I go with myself. Also, it's like, I understand the grind is okay. It's okay to be a little sore. It's okay to be a little bit tired. It's okay to um, skip some of those times where everybody else is celebrating. It's okay to do all those. Man, the 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 Gatorade tasted better, better at the top of the podium. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, it's yep. okay. I love that, man. I mean, the big belief of mine, something I talk about often, is principles are principles. They can apply everywhere once you know them, right? So it's yeah. learning those principles of success and then applying them, like you said, whether it was judo or something else. He was teaching his kids how to endure those things, those principles behind it. And then they can implement those academically, another sport, what, you know, dance, whatever it is. So, all right, yeah. let's, let's do this. Uh, before we get into WWE, tell me a little bit about your, you know, you talked about it a little bit, a little bit about your MMA background. Um, you know, what drew you to that? I mean, a lot of wrestlers fight, right? And then what was like, yeah. what were some of the things that you sort of enjoyed or maybe didn't enjoy? I don't know. Just tell me a little bit about your MMA background. Um, MMA, you know, for me, it was like, since the way my career happened where wrestling just got cut out of nowhere, and then I went into WWE, so it's a whole different kind of competition that you train for, I still had that desire to compete. So when I left WWE, I was like, I want to start fighting. So I came out here, and I talked to a boxing coach. And he and I started working a little bit, you know, he's teaching me the, the, the basis at the beginning, you know, and um, then I get a call from a guy down in, in Florida. Um, he's actually John Jones manager, Malky, called me up, flew me down to Florida, um, talked to me about managing me, hooked, and set me up with the American top team. And then at that point, I was flying back and forth from Denver and I was going down there training. An American top team, I mean, at that time, there was like Bigfoot, there was Hector Lombard, there was a lot of really, really tough, big, um, um, Bill Santos is down there now, he wasn't there at the time, but a lot of people were, were down there, it was a big training camp, so I just went down there, and I started training, and I started learning, but for me, it was like at the beginning, my first fight, I was semi-main event at American Airlines Arena, um, and that's not the approach that I wanted to take, like for me, coming from a wrestling background, um, I wanted to start at the bottom you know I wanted to learn like I didn't want to just get into fights but because of my name from WWE I was thrusted into fights and I was thrusted into like being on TV right away when I when I started fighting for strike force and just getting thrown into a cage where most guys they'll do like amateurs for a while get comfortable in the cage move to the pros and then work their way up not me my very first fight I'm semi-main event at the American Airlines arena which is a large arena in Miami and um, I think the main event was like, um, 
man, I can't even remember at this time. I'm, yeah, I'm Jeff Munson against um, Pedro, Pedro Huzo, I think. So I, I was on a legit card. Freaked me out, you know, when you get to your first fight, if if that's not what you were just brought up doing. I mean, I, was, I brought up competing with wrestling. But then after that, I just, I stayed with that camp. I went to AKA because um, I wanted to get up there with Cormier and because I trained with Cormier at the Olympic Training Center. So I wanted to be up there with him, Kane, and some of those guys, Josh Thompson, Josh Koscheck. All those guys were friends of mine when I was in WWE. So I just naturally jumped back and forth from AK to American Top Team. And I was training with some of the best best fighters in the world. you know. And um, I fought for Strike Force for, for a few years and then suffered my first loss. That was just, it was a lot of behind that. But um. At that time, I took a break, and I was like, I want to start back over, and I did a lot of small promotions. I fought up in Canada. I fought up in Kansas City for um, Joe. Yeah. Um, Wooster, maybe. And then I fought a whole bunch. Of, yeah. And then I fought a whole bunch of little smaller promotions, and then after that, I got picked back up by Bellator, and then I fought with Bellator. Right now, I'm still, I'm still contracted with Bellator for, I think, four or five more fights. If I ever go back to fighting, I have to fight with them. But yeah. currently... My record is, I believe it's 18 and two mm -hmm. um, right now. So, fun India Super Fight League. And um, that was just something that, that I did because I wanted to do. It yeah. wasn't something that I needed to do. Um, I just wanted to fight because I wanted to compete. Mm -hmm. That's all a it was. Lot of, a lot of people deal with nerves, right? They get nervous when they go out and compete. Um, get nervous if the public speaking or get nervous if they're going out to wrestle a match, play a football game, whatever. You know, you've competed so much now and you love competing, but you've competed so much now. It's got to be scary the first time you step in the cage, especially like you said, you didn't have a lot of time to train and they're throwing you into a big event. What are a couple of things that you do mindset wise or that you've done um, to help deal with nerves and still go out and perform to your ability? Uh, you know, mine, mine is routine. You know, one thing that I did, and I did this all the way through college, and I, and I kept doing it when I was fighting, and I still kind of do it sometimes when I'm trying to hype myself up when I go out into professional wrestling. Um, there was a t-shirt that I had from Wheaton College. It was a blue t-shirt with orange writing on it. I used to wear that in the practice room a lot at Valley. And when I used to wrestle, I would keep that t-shirt with me, and I would warm up with that t-shirt because afterwards, right before coming out, I would always pull it off, and I would always... And I would take a deep breath in it. There was something that triggered me because I had that same smell of being in the wrestling room, the yeah. practice room. So the repetition, I always do the exact same warm up, And then I always keep something with me that I trained with. Because there's something about when I was training, I always felt like I was at the peak of my game when I was training. You know, in the practice room, there's no, there's no crowds. There's just you, you know, just honing your skills, learning, getting better, wrestling, doing all kinds of things. So right before I got out on the mat, I had that thing and just the smell, because you know that smell that you have in a wrestling room, there's there's just that smell. Yeah, That smells nowhere else in the world. When you step in the wrestling room, you just have that smell. Um, so when you're competing around the middle of the basketball court with a mat there, or you're going in a cage and the cage is just different, it has a whole different environment. So I always bring something with me just to bring it in. And, and then when I do that, it just it puts me right back in the frame of mind and practice to being smooth and perfect and everything like that. So I try to get my mind back to when, you know, practice makes perfect. So I try to get back to that time where I felt like I was perfect. Um, so that's what I do to kind of keep myself in that, 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 that mind frame. But then um, the nerves for me, it's like, um, I, I don't give myself an opportunity to, to get nervous because I started telling myself, you know what, when I, when I didn't fight, this is what I did in fighting because fighting I had, I used to just, I, man, it, it was, it's just a brain trip when you fight. And I, and I think the reason it was tough for me is because I had a big name. Mm -hmm. So that some of the headlines couldn't wait to, but w, Oh, former professional wrestler, because they don't, they don't rem remember the fact that I did amateur wrestling for years that, yeah. that my black belt in wrestling gets erased because I was a professional wrestler. They look at me as like, oh, this actor comes to an MMA and he fails. So a lot of the a lot of the news headlines were just waiting to write that. Yeah. I had people betting big against me because they thought that I was going to fail. 
So for me, it was like, I'm not, I, don't, I didn't want to prove those people right. Mm -hmm. Wanted to go out there and perform. So my nerves was just like tarnishing my image, my name that I built up because I didn't need to be there. I could be professional wrestling for the rest of my life and making a very healthy living. But I was going in the cage, putting my whole name on the line. Yeah. So that's when nervous kind of get, it kind of got to me a little bit. But then when I started getting into the room, I started thinking ahead of time. I started thinking, you know, on a on a Friday the morning of, that I'm fighting, I'm fighting that evening, and I was like, you know what? Saturday is going to get here, and all this is going to be over. Like the amount that you actually sit and get nervous that you destroy your head and your mind and your body is going to go like that. Mm. I was like, at most, I'm going to be in that ring for 15 minutes. That's a, that's a quarter of an hour. That's that's this much of an entire day. And then that's gone. The last fight I had is gone. I'm months away from that fight. So I, so why am I going to destroy myself and kill myself thinking in the head too much about this? Just go have fun with it and actually sit there and like enjoy every part of it. I mean, when you get out in the cage, it's like put your feet down on the ground and like, and, and, and put your feet on the mat because you, there's going to be a time that you're not going to have that feeling again. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a time when you walk into that ring where you get those cold chills. Embrace that. Feel good about that. You can look around at these crowd, these people going crazy. All this, there's a guy standing across from you. He's been training forever. You're going to not, you, all that's going to be taken away from you pretty soon. You're not going to have that feeling ever again. Like right now, I don't, I'm not doing that anymore. And I wish I could just go into a cage just to feel that. Not even the fighting part. I just wish I can come back and feel that, man. It's I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it. So fighters right now, I'm like, man, forget the fighting stuff. We've already trained, prepared, and everything like that. Don't question yourself. You're ready. Enjoy all of this. Yeah. If you can enjoy this, you have fun. And if you have fun, you will win. But the minute you go in and you close yourself up and you're like, oh, my God, people are there. Oh, my God, my feet feel oh, – I'm slipping on this mat. This mat doesn't feel good. My gloves don't feel good. I think it's too tight. And they start doing all this stuff then you're losing the everything you're losing all of this This is life you win or lose it doesn't really even matter it really doesn't matter at the end of the day i, I was i was a wreck when i lost my match i mean uh, i couldn't even breathe for like a day but now i look back at that and i can almost laugh at it so instead of putting myself in a negative i'm like man all of this is amazing walk into the ring i should be feeling all these butterflies in my stomach right now this is awesome this is incredible i go over here the referee standing there i watched this on tv this is incredible and, and now i'm doing it you know the, all these people cheering or booing they're, they're cheering for me so I, I i take all that in and i'm like man because pretty soon I'm going to be the 40-year-old man or 50-year-old man that's sitting back saying, oh, you know, back in my day. So why not enjoy that now? Enjoy the wins. Enjoy the losses. Enjoy the, the journey. Enjoy the everything. Shaking my coach's hand, giving him a hug before I go in. Man, you got you to enjoy every, every second of everything that you do. And if you enjoy it, man, you, you know it. The fighters that are enjoying things and are just having fun, those are the most dangerous people out there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that is uh, that's chock full of great advice right there, man. So I'm taking uh, I'm going to make sure all my wrestlers listen to this. Right. So I'm going to get all my wrestlers and maybe, OK, you guys have to listen to this because especially me and man, it goes so quick. And some of them will go on to wrestle in college. Some of them right. will some of them will go on and fight. Um, but man, e even at that, like you said, it goes so quick. So why not enjoy it? And then, yeah, you gave a lot of good tips there about how to not just enjoy it, but man, the repetition, controlling what you can control and not worrying about the rest. Yeah. Those are all just yeah. incredible things that, that apply so much to sport, but again, apply to life, man. So I do a lot of public speaking. And for me, like you get a little bit of that nervousness that you get like before you compete, but at the same time, man, it makes you feel really good. But I think like all the years of having to, I mean, whenever you've wrestled in front of thousands of people and then you're walking there to speak in front of thousands of people, like, it's not really that nerve wracking because it's just you talking. There's not somebody trying to rip your head off. You know, it's like, <laughs> right. you're a little bit. But it's 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 it's, it, it's the same thing, man. If 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 we just if we just understood that everything in life is for a purpose and we have to enjoy the ups and downs, the highs, and enjoy every 
bit of life, man. I went down there in training. I was sitting there, man, this is heavy. This is hard. But I was like, this is awesome. So the ability to do it, man. If we start enjoying things, more positive things come to us. Man, when you when when I remember every time before before I, I, I went and wrestled um, in college, and I'm getting goosebumps even talking about this now, because like there's a lot of things that I'm, I'm, I get excited about. I mean, you know, you, you sit in the room with your partner, you got your hoodie on, everything, you're going through all your stuff, and then afterwards you're just that calm, and the coach comes by you. And Joe used to come by me, and he used to just come by me like this, and he look at me like and just smile, and I just like smile like a kid in a candy store. I was like. <laughs> Ooh, I'm gonna go eat this dude up. I don't even know. I'm. It's nothing about him, man. I I, I trained so much. I got these cool moves that I want to try to do. I'm gonna steamroll this guy. It's gonna be awesome because afterwards, then it is the crowd. It, like everything. I, it, like if if people learn to enjoy and stop getting in their own heads about little bitty things, they would see so many people that blossom into like greats in anything you know how it is even when public speaking you got to get you got to get ready if you come out there like hey guys my name is bobby lashley and i then that's how the crowd's going to be but if you're like man let me tell you guys something about how great life is yeah okay and and and, I, and i'm not i don't have a cape on my back or anything like that i came from the same place everyone here came from maybe even less it's just that my desire my hunger for 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 enjoying everything about life is just on a different level than most people. And that's why I keep accomplishing things. I can't wait to wake up in the morning just so that I can have a new day to try something new. Or like me and my son, we're gonna go do something. Me and my daughter, uh, we're, she, she just got her car so I'm excited about taking her driving. And, and like, it, like, at what point do we start not being excited about the little bitty things? Mm -hmm. And if we if we start looking at that like man just think about it. if you had your whole team and, and all and before a tournament you know you just look at each one of your guys and they just look at you like oh coach they're like oh man i'll send these guys out go get them go get them go get them and then these guys are wrestling like that um it's just the the just the the positive energy and, and everything like that that's all i've been guided for but then being real also i had a, i had coaches that were just uh, real real to me like my coach in the army and before he come he was always a harder coach he was like i would come by you guys and ask you guys if you guys are ready but every one of you guys would be like yeah coach i'm ready yeah coach i'm ready i'm not gonna ask you about that he said but you know what you can't lie to yourself the night before a wrestling tournament wrestling duel or something like that there's a time where you're standing in front of the mirror and you question yourself am i ready you can't lie to yourself there mm -hmm. because what yourself is going to tell you, man, you know, two weeks ago when you told yourself you were going to get up at five o'clock in the morning and that alarm went off and you said, not right now and not right now. And then you end up not doing it and you didn't get that extra workout. Those are the things that make you doubt. So if you can handle those things at the time and make sure that you put in all the work and just have fun with everything. But put in that work, make everything fun. Like right now, I've been doing this program. It's called Coach Your Kid. And it's my son. Me and my son, I post little clips of different things that I do with him online because I always say that I want my son to enjoy working out, training, and getting better. Yeah. I don't care what sport he plays. I don't care what he does. <laughs> I just want him to um, understand that uh, with the right amount of work and dedication and drive and all that other stuff and you, you're gonna have anything so just my son's the most positive kid my kids are the most positive kids out there they're, they're not walking around with like they're happy they're excited about things not because they have a lot of stuff because i don't buy a lot of stuff mm -hmm. um it's because you got to teach kids to to enjoy what you have enjoy what you do yeah well your your enjoyment your passion so I always say, man, there's a few things in life you can't fake. You know, you can't fake being in shape. <laughs> That's going to get exposed if you're confused. <laughs> you can't fake confidence because at some point you will hit adversity and we're going to know. Yeah. Like you said, that's where you yeah. look at yourself in the mirror and you can't lie to yourself. And you can't fake passion. And like I can hear the passion in your voice, man. So when you're talking about the things that get you excited, like that's real. We can hear that. So you can't fake passion, man. Yeah. I, I love it. And I'm taking in this parenting advice too because I got four littles of my own. So I'm listening. <laughs> you know what? Uh, I, you know, I, I, I look up to you guys. I follow you guys. I follow you guys and your teams and stuff like that, man. You, you know what? I, everybody's like, so what are you going to do? Because like, 
I love WWE. I love wrestling. I love I love performing. I absolutely love that. But man, my my wholehearted passion right now in life is to take over. I want to be a high school wrestling coach. Mm. That is just that to me. Just that was probably some of the my wrestling years was probably some of the greatest years of my life. Yeah. And I kind of want to get back there. I want to see kids and I want to talk to them and I want to explain some of the things that, that's going through their head because over the season, because you know how many different obstacles that you had to go through when you were wrestling, you know, from your freshman year to your senior year um, and then on through college, just everything from like weight cutting to, like you said, injuries to learning something new to your opponents that you have. There's so many different obstacles and I want to teach kids how to overcome those obstacles. Yeah, everybody can teach a double leg. I, my double leg's gonna be better than everybody else's that I'm gonna <laughs> teach. But <laughs> everybody can teach a double leg, but you can't teach, like you said, that that passion, that desire, that drive, and that understanding of, or, or persistence is my favorite word when it goes to the sport of wrestling. Um, that if if you go out there and you tell the coach, yeah, I'm gonna double leg and take it down. And you actually do it, and there's nothing that's going to stop you from doing it. I don't want to hear an excuse as to why you didn't get it. You said you were going to do it, make it happen. If it doesn't happen, to be, you got it. Like, like you know, when I wrestled in college, like everybody in the entire country knew what I was going to do. Mm-hmm. Like, watch out for that blast double leg. It's going to go, or I'm going to snap his head down. I'm going to duck under his armor. I'm going to trip and take it to the side. I'm going to shoot a single leg. That's what I'm going to do. So, coach, if you want to train your guys. To stop that, you can, but I'm still going to do it. Yeah. Still going to do it. Yeah. I'm, 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 you're not going to change my mind. I am going to take you down with this double leg at some point in time. And I'm going to keep going hard until doing it. And I feel that if I keep saying that I am going to get that double leg, it doesn't give him an opportunity to even set up anything towards me because mm-hmm. I'm still trying to get mine in. Yeah. I don't give them an opportunity to be a part of this match. This match is you as a <laughs> as a workout dummy for me so don't try anything just stay there i'm going to try a whole bunch of stuff on you you can try to counter it you can try to slow it down but this is basically for me yeah yeah well and you did that a lot and you know that reminds me of john smith too you know everybody was like going into his second olympics you know i remember somebody asked him like hey you know you shoot a high crotch and low level everybody in the world knows that are you going to change it up <laughs> he's like why would i and they're like, well, they know Why would I defend it. And he was like, I've done it thousands and thousands and thousands. Of times. <laughs> How many times have they defended me doing it on them? You know, I'm like, that makes perfect sense. It completely changed my yeah. mind about, you know, as yeah. far as training and what your opponent does. And yes. Yeah, yeah. so, was Kale, was Kale, was Kale Sanderson, was he, was he thinking, I'm not going to do this ankle pick this match. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or was anybody in the entire arena saying, watch the ankle pick. Yeah. He's still going to do it. The greats, the greats don't change things up, man. You know what? I'll tell you. I'm going to make a long story really quick. Um, but this is something that hit me with my sophomore year that kind of changed things through my sophomore year being on JV to my junior year being on in the state finals. When I was in sophomore, I went to a camp. camp. Eric Akins was at this camp. Mm-hmm. And it was in um, Baker, Kansas. Right? And we were in a gym. And the gym was hot. So we had the doors open. It was summer hundred some kids in there we're all doing all kinds of stuff doing some drills and then they had a break in the camp and they said all right everybody can go to lunch so the mats are all sweaty it's hot in the room steaming the doors open that's that's the only air conditioning and up in the top in the rafters in the big rafters they had those big um you know and um those metal rafters and they had this frisbee stuck in there when those floppy frisbees stuck in there mm-hmm. and at camp normally you know how wrestlers are somebody found a tennis ball they threw it up there and then there's like a bunch of guys there, like half the camp there and there's like a hundred kids in the camp so they would boom and then everybody would run and get the ball all right give him space give him space and he'd get a shot at it you know just stupid games that wrestlers would play yeah. i was over on the side doing some wrestling drills or wrestling live with three guys but i was sitting there and i was like for me i'm very observant so i was watching aiken aiken said he don't even know the story um watching him Boom, they're throwing, boom, they're throwing. And as they're going, since he said lunch, you know, some of the guys would throw for a little bit and then they would leave and they would leave. And Akins was there with these guys. And it went from like 50 guys to 40 guys to 30 guys to 12. And then it kept going down. And I'm sitting there and at this point, they're probably about a good 45 minutes into it. 
And it's at the point where when they throw that ball up, everybody's running, they're sliding on the mats and they're having to fight for the ball. You know, all right, give him room, give him room. All right, he gets shot and he throws it up there. And they did this for like 45 minutes to an hour. And at this point, there was like maybe like three people left, Eric and two other guys. And they kept on throwing it, throwing it, and they finally, boom, hit it, and then, like, dust fell down. It was like, oh, they almost got it. Nope, it's still lodged up there. So they kept throwing and throwing and throwing and throwing and throwing, and then, and then everybody was like, he was like, all right, you guys go ahead, go ahead, go to lunch and everything. And he kept throwing it. Boom, 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 <laughs> finally he hits it, and then the thing fell down. Nobody's there except us sitting on the side in a little four-man group. He takes that frisbee, walks past us, and, and I was sitting down. And he walks over by me, and he was like, "Hey, man, you want a frisbee?" And he tosses it to me and walks out. Mm -hmm. That was a huge, huge, huge like part of my life. Um, had nothing to do with the frisbee. He threw the frisbee to me. He took second in the Olympics, and I was like, "How do you become him mm -hmm. when everybody else quit?" He kept going. Yeah. It's that persistence. If I shoot a double leg, I'm getting that double leg, no matter what. He started throwing that tennis ball up there to get that dog on Frisbee there. And he was not going to stop until that damn thing came down. Right. Or if he had to climb up to the rafters and, and yank it down. But his persistence through that was something that I was like, I get it. Yeah, I get it. Like some guys go in the restroom, they have 15 different takedowns that they want to do. 15 ticket, 15 different takedowns to me means I'm going to fail at this one. I'm going to fail at this. One, I'm going to fail at this. One, I'm going to fail at this one. And maybe one of them might work as opposed to, I am going to shoot this high crotch into this single leg, switch it over in a double leg. He's going to defend it, but I need to get that. Mm -hmm. get, and, and, and at the, if I, at the last damn second, then I can't get it. Then I switch over to something else and boom, that's gotta be there. Because this guy is putting so much attention in me finishing that double leg that the, the peak out is going to work now. Mm -hmm. In life, everything. In work, everything. Finding ways to solve problems and being persistent at them are going to keep you moving in, a, in, in, in the right direction. Yeah, I'm 44 years old and I guarantee you I train, more, I train harder than most of the guys in the WWE right now. Mm -hmm. These guys are like, what are you doing? I'm like, it's, it's not so I'm not taking anything. I get up at five o'clock in the morning every morning, every morning. And I'm and I, like, and I, and I, before I was just jump roping 30 minutes, jump roping, then I eat breakfast, or I just go do something, go sit, stretch, meditate, something like that. And then I get my workout in later on throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And I train <laughs> like, like I have a goal in mind. And I, and it's consistency. I've been doing it forever. Yeah, it's not making me. It, it just it, I feel like I'm getting like today when I left my strength and conditioning over at Landau's, I looked at him and I was like, man, I feel good. <laughs> and he looked at me, and I said, man, I, you know what? I I really seriously think I might want to fight again. And he goes, really? I was like, maybe I guess. Yeah, I feel that good. Yeah. Maybe I'm just telling myself that. Either way, I believe it. Either way, it's the same to me. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing my, how my, my, just, it's amazing how you can just kick the dog out of yourself and you feel phenomenal after. It was tough during, but you feel right. phenomenal after, man. So you well, while we're great. while we're speaking on, because man, I'm, yeah, I'm huge on persistence. I'm huge on consistency. Let's go ahead and transition right into what are some of the and you talked a little bit about your training. What are some of these success habits, like daily success habits that you do that allow you to continue to train at a high level and perform at a high level? What are some of the things that we could be implementing in our lives or that you always do? Um, for, I, I think the biggest thing just off the bat is understanding your body. Mm -hmm. um, because I would say something for me, and I, and I don't want like somebody that's 18 years old, 17 years old in high school to, to think they need to do the same thing. Yeah. Um, I think you need to understand your body and you need to, um, there's a, there's a level of a hundred percent for our body. We don't need to be past it. We need to be right at it. So for me, recovery is like the biggest thing that you can do. Because if we can stay at 100%, we can perform at 100%, we can train at 100%, everything like that. We get to the point of thinking that that's not important. Um, the right things are just important. 
um, doing the right things. Like for right now, I think we talked about it before, like <laughs> in my, in my training room, I'm just, I just been moving into my house. So everything's kind of out of there, but I have a lot of my training stuff, like around it. Like I, I have an infrared light that I, <laughs> that I put on different parts of my body that I just picked up from Amazon not too long ago. It just helps out with inflammation. I have my Norma Tech boots sitting right here that I put these things on all the time. Um, help out with inflammation of my legs, uh, <clears throat> stretching, um, warm up. So those things are those things are almost even more important than the actual physical activities of what we do in the gym. If you and, and the reason why I said it, I, I don't want some of the younger guys to do some of the things that I do is because I'm a little bit older. And when you're younger, you can push your body a lot more than you can do when you're older. Older, we need a little bit more recovery. As you're when you're younger, you can push the like man it's it's to me being young is like having a ferrari and never taking it over 60 miles per hour <laughs> because when you're young step on the pedal like man i was i was doing my two mile in 10 30 uh, when i was when i was younger yeah. um like when i would sprint i would run like i would run until i felt like i was gonna like disappear <laughs> like i felt like the flash at times yeah. when you're a kid you can do that you can push it as hard as you can um so turn that throttle up and push it as hard as you can like if you ask some of the adults right now when was the last time you ran so hard that you just felt like i can't run any faster and most of the people are like uh maybe like 20 30 years yeah and that's that's real you know a lot of people are like i hadn't done that since i was a kid i was like i did that yesterday <laughs> because I, I still want to be a kid but i'm saying man the best feeling in the world is when you get into that like natural high if people want to use that term um i remember when i used to train when i was at valley i would get out and i would just be running and there was a time where there's there's a time in any any phase where it's like this sucks all right this is hard oh i'm about to break down now i'm at a whole different level yeah and i think every most people this is hard most people leave oh this is killing me most people leave not too many people make it to that part of I'm running as fast as I can and the exchange of oxygen is not like I'm not even getting tired. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, I'm going as fast as I can and and I'm trying to blow myself up because I can't. You know, as, as a young kid, if, if people understood how amazing the human body was and, and the capabilities that you have and what you can do with your body, man, they would turn it up turn that volume up man and just just and some people are because you see records being broke every day mm -hmm. and, and the only reason records are being broke every day is because people are coming out with oh he did that i'm gonna do more oh he ran a five minute mile i'm gonna run a four minute mile i ran a four minute mile i'm gonna run a three minute mile people are always trying to evolve and i think it, when you're young you you got to evolve you got to push that level they always say the greats are somebody that are doing something before their time. Michael Jordan, if he was playing today, he wouldn't be Michael Jordan against LeBron James, no way. Mm -hmm. But he was, he was, he was before his time then. Yeah. LeBron James is before his time. In ten years, like the whole basketball team is going to be his height or taller and more athletic and more str and stronger and everything like that. So be before your time. Set the bar. Be the be the bar that people are going for. Yeah, that's what I try to tell kids, man. It's 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 amazing being on top. Um, and I don't think anybody's ever been on top. I mean, I've been on I've been on a high level at, at at certain things, but I'm still climbing. I think there's just so much more. And I always say that with my son is like, uh, they're like, hey man, your son's gonna be the next Bobby Lashley. I said, no, he's not. He's gonna be the next Miles Lashley because Miles Lashley is gonna be at a way higher level than anything that I've done. And I'm going to set the bar really high for him, mm -hmm. but I, I, but I know that he's going to crush it. After you're done class. Okay. I'll be down there in a little bit. Yeah. So speaking, speaking of the kiddos. So, Hey, and I, I keep it real on my, on my podcast. So some people go in and trim stuff out. I'm like, I got four kids. Man, let's be absolutely <laughs> real because people that are listening to this. I have athletes, I got coaches, I got parents, got everybody, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's that's a big part of life. But yeah, so so you're set the bar high, man. And I love that. Like you said, when you're young, you're a Ferrari and you can just push that pedal down. 
And I think a lot of us get old, a lot of people get old and, and like you, like I still train super hard, but I think a lot of people, not that we don't need more recovery and be smarter about it, but a lot of people get old because they quit doing those things. They you like, quit. yeah. when's the last time you went out and ran hard? It's like oh, 20 years. When's the last time you read a book, uh, college or high school? Like they quit doing the things that allowed them to right. grow and be young. So we can yes. still do it when we're older. Grow. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's like, the, that's the, that's the biggest word. That's the biggest word in life is growth. Um, we have to continue to grow. People got to understand that you got to continue to grow. Um, you got, you got to read, like you said, you got to read, you have to, you have to, you have to condition your body, you have to condition your mind, you have to continue to grow. If you don't continue to grow, you die. Mm -hmm. how, how, how is that? How that's, that's something so simple, but people won't look at it at that simple. Yeah. If you don't grow, you die, right? If you take a, fl a flower, if that flower stops growing, it dies, right? Or does it just stay there? No, it, it dies. Everything has to continue to grow. That's the same thing with us. We die inside, we die mentally, we die physically, if we just don't keep growing. Learn something new. Man, and, and, and this, ain't, this ain't bragging or anything like that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I feel, com I'm, I'm in comfortable position financially. But you know what I'm doing after I get off of here? I'm working on my real estate license. <laughs> I'm at home. I can do real estate license at, um, online. So that's gonna be another stream of income I'm trying to tap into. Because I feel that, you know, and I'm not just going to be lifting weights and doing professional wrestling and doing some of that. I, I, I want to learn something. I want to learn something on to move forward. So I'm doing that. Once I get my real estate license, I've been doing a lot of real estate transactions, real estate deals. So I'm going to save money there. But just the fact of, of saying, look, all this time that we have right now, people are like, oh, the lockdown sucks or anything like that. I'm like, what are you talking about? That's more time I get to spend with my kids. I get to help them out. I get to, I get to learn something new. I get time to read. I'm not so busy. I can I can breathe for a second. So if we make the most of this time, then it, then it's not that bad. I, I enjoy the fact of being able to sit down with my kid and when he has his assignments there and and help him out with math because I'm like, dang, I, I haven't done this since, you know. And I'm learning and I'm getting back to it. And I was like, ah oh, man, that's great. I love that. That that's that to me is a, is another perk of being um, time. Yeah, so we have it. You know what I was, you know what I was thinking also? I was I was trying to put this together um just with talking with parents. I used to parents and kids and coaches and everything. Um, I was doing this plan where it was gonna be, I was I was gonna call remember, remember back in the day where they had the whole sports illustrated and on the back page they would like highlight like four, three or four kids or something like that, and they would tell what their athletic, you know, this guy won states or whatever. What I was gonna do is I was gonna do a youtube series where i was going to different areas and meeting different kids that are just at a different level yeah. um there was a kid here right down the street from me named colton schultz that was winning like juniors and cadets and everything like that and there's kids like that that are excelling at different parts i don't care if it's baseball basketball football i don't care if it's tennis something in school just anything there's kids that are doing some like astronomical things and what i wanted to do is meet with the kids first off just talk with them because what I, what, what interests me is um, what makes these kids better. And I want this, I want this to come on on a channel. What makes these kids better? Because when like every parent wants their kid to be great, but you take a kid like Colton Schultz, you sit him down and say, Colton, you know what? You're I, I'm looking at you. Yeah. You're a big kid, but there's all these other kids at your side. It's maybe bigger. Like, why do you feel that you're just going to go out there and kill this kid? Because he just goes out there with this like confidence level that's through the roof. Like what, what is the thing? Like, is it because you just train so much and, and, and you just feel like I'm ready and I'm prepared to beat anyone? Or is it because um, I'm hungry or because it's because I'm angry or because like, what is it up here? Because, you know, there's always kids that we talk about that just like separate themselves from the group. And I think a lot of parents would like to know what these kids are thinking, what these kids are doing, what makes them better than everyone else. And I want the kids to answer that question of what they think. I don't know what I would have said when I was in high school, when I won state or when I won nationals. I don't know if you would ask me, why do I feel that I'm beating everyone right now? Mm -hmm. I, I would have just, I don't know. I would, I, but if I was, if I, if somebody asked me that question and forced something out of me, it would have been interested to hear what I said. Yeah. 
And I wanted to do something like that, just going with different kids like that. There's kids like 10 years old that are like multiple state champions that are just walking around with the stroke of confidence. It's like, what did you just like, like, how are you better than everyone else? Yeah. I think that's, it's, it's, it, to me, it's fascinating. Just the psychology of sports and how you have in a wrestling room, one kid just like steps out and says, forget it. I'm winning everything. <laughs> it's like, where, where did this come from? But I like it. Yeah. You say you can't teach it. If you can't teach it, we can at least try to understand it a little bit so that we can help out other kids that are maybe struggling with that piece so that they can become great. Yeah. Maybe if you look at it be, by, by this point of view that this other kid has already learned, adapted, and, and used, maybe if you can see it from his point of view, maybe that might help you win a match or two more than you did before. Yeah, I love that, man, because, I mean, it's a big reason on my podcast I – I interview a lot of high achievers, all right, in various areas, and a lot of them are athletes, but I've had some of the top businessmen on I me in mean, so different areas, and I love, and, you know, just like right now, I don't send you these questions ahead of time, man. We, I ask questions, and it's just off the top of the dome because I'm interested to hear what makes you different than the normal person, and I would yeah. love to hear that from a kid's perspective because we've had time to look back and reflect at our age. We've had time yeah. since 2020 kids don't a lot of times they may not even know or they may know and kids are just so brutally honest sometimes i would love to hear their answer yeah. what comes out of their you know comes out of their mouth too so i think that's a <laughs> yeah if, if if a kid just says i don't know i think i'm just better than everyone else yeah <laughs> I would say, you know some kids may say that yep. but why <laughs> why why it's, it's crazy because, like, my son plays football right now. My son is he's awesome as a, as a cornerback. There's other kids in the league, and some of the kids are like, you'll see a kid that's like, oh, wow, this kid's amazing. Is it, is it, you know, my kids, my coach or kids program, um, the reason why I do that is because what I feel like some, uh, some kids don't develop the natural motor skills that just make them better at sports, like mm -hmm. hand and eye coordination, depth perception, um, um balance coordination some of these things they don't pick up so i'm going to help out with that but even at even playing fields where all those kids have all those that are equal there's always that one kid that's like give me the ball yeah and yeah. that's like a not and then we keep saying that's 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 the behavior that can't be learned and maybe it can't be learned but maybe it can be explained and taught mm -hmm. um it may not make somebody like it may not take a kid that in, that's in high school that's not placing in state and then that now he's a colton schultz where he's winning worlds and winning nationals and stuff like that but it might take him to have a, a, a negative thought pattern going into a match and losing and maybe it takes him on to state maybe it takes him on to winning regionals maybe it takes him on just a couple steps past where he is now possibly yeah. Yeah, absolutely and like you said earlier there's only sometimes it's just little things right it is persistence it's you watching coach aiken mm -hmm. going over and over and over just a little thing but that little thing clicked with you when it clicked it changed yeah. things and so a lot of times we're looking for like, i need a whole manual you know sometimes you don't <laughs> yeah. sometimes it's just a little thing just a little mindset shift that can change things for you yeah yeah you know somebody just told me that before i, I was like because I, I, I keep getting these like like I wanted to get this like self-help books, you know, those um, you know, rich dad, poor dad, different things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I was talking to somebody about it. He was like, uh, he said, man, you don't have to read the whole book. He said, he said, you can skim through the book and read the, the points that you want to really get some more information in. Mm -hmm. Some of these, some of the chapters in the book, you've already mastered. You already know. You already like you, you can, you can skim over it. But if they're saying all the things that you already know, then okay, you can move past that. So I think that's kind of like with anything. And some things that you don't have to like really dial into, but some things you can just find out what you need to dial into and, and, and put more effort into that. Maybe that's all you need. I like that. You don't need the whole book. Yeah. You just maybe need a couple chapters in that book that can really help you out. Yeah, I like or that. Well, you know, even, even on a more spiritual side, you know, you, you don't need to, th there's, there's certain things that happen in your life that you don't need the whole Bible to explain it, but there might be a chapter in a Bible or maybe even a verse in the Bible that helps you out with what you're going through or what you need. Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. 
So, all right, man, because, you know, we're going to have some WWE fans that are they're listening to this. Um, they're going to see Bobby Lashley's on here. I'm so the best. <laughs> give me, like, dude, you got to have a lot of experiences now. So tell me, like, what are, like, what's one or two things behind the scene that we don't know about, man, the general public doesn't know about, that they would be surprised? And then, like, just maybe, like, a cool experience, whether it was a place you traveled or competed or whatever, just give us the behind-the-scene look at the WWE. Well, let me answer some of the questions first off that everybody asks. Um, is this like a big choreographed thing? As no, and the reason why is because, like, and on a normal schedule, we're wrestling two hundred something days a year. Mm. I don't have a good enough memory to re- remember two hundred some matches, <laughs> so that's that. Um, you know, there's cool people backstage. There's people that you want to beat up for real backstage. Yeah. Um, and it is extremely competitive. And um, it's the easiest, hardest job that you'll ever do. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so, like I was talking to one of the guys, we were driving back from the airport yesterday and he was asking me about it and we were just talking about it. He goes, he said, you know what, this is a, this is one of those businesses that you really, it's, it's hard to explain to anybody because there's just so many different dynamics to the company and characters and, and it, it's, 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 it's pure, it's pure entertainment chaos. <laughs> so, um, when you, when I walk out there, it, it's, it's hard hard to it's hard to explain or or what even avenue to go to if i wanted to talk about professional wrestling um it is competitive it's competitive because you want your character to get over you want your character to be somebody that um is needed in 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 the show yeah um and in, in the wrestling show one thing that we try to do is we try to tell stories all the way through the Deal. There's a story within the match. Um, if you and I got in a fight, there has to be an outcome of that fight. There's an outcome of what people normally from the outside looking in are going to see. It's like, oh, Bobby's there, but didn't, but this, but this. And they start asking different questions. Who wins in a fight between John Jones and Conor McGregor? You think John Jones whenever it was a real fight, but. Maybe and then, not. And then, okay. So, so that's the first part. You would say John Jones. Okay. Tell me how the fight would go down. Uh, John Jones is enormous, and he probably elbows Conor McGregor in the in the head and puts him to sleep. <laughs> or <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that would definitely that, that would definitely be a scenario. <laughs> so, and then and then like you might have somebody else. No, no, what? No one, because Conor's because Conor's slick, so he's not. He's going to stay away from Jones. He's going to try to pick him at angles and stuff like that. So now you're so 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 I'm using that as a way of explaining what I do. Yeah. If I go in a fight with Conor McGregor, then they're going to be like, well, Conor could do this, Conor could do that. So we're basically giving you the scenarios that should happen. Mm -hmm. Like ultimately, I'm going to pick him up and slam him through the mat, and it's going to be over. Yeah. But before that, he might be able to move out of the way. He's long, he's rangy, he has a good left hand, so you might be trying to do that. So you might be trying to set up that left hand, get bait me to come in to hit that left hand. So it's basically a story within a story all the time. That's the first part. Um, professional wrestling is a lot more in depth than a lot of people understand. And I think once people get into the wrestling world, they get like addicted to it because it's 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 the most interestingly amazing thing that you can do. I mean, I've been in front of crowds that when I when I did WrestleMania, I was in front of a crowd that had ninety eight thousand people walking out in front of those people. And everybody's staring at me because I'm the only one walking out at the time, you know, and I got to perform in this ring. It's, it's like, that's, that's one of those times where I said before, if I didn't teach myself to love those situations, love that fear, love that shyness, love everything about that situation, love the fact that I might slip when I get up on that rope and fall down on my butt. And the whole crowd, 90,000 people laugh at me and this gets put in the record books. That may happen. Yeah. That could either destroy my life or I could laugh and say, guess what? 
98,000 people are going to remember me on that day <laughs> because of that slip up that I did. So I'm telling you, there's nothing that can happen in that match that's going to put me in a bad mood because I'm enjoying every second of it. Yeah. And that's what wrestling's about. It's about um, transfer of energy. I'm a big energy person. So when I go out, I have an intense energy and I'm telling the story in a match and I want people to feel what I feel. I want people when I slam somebody down, boom, I, people understand that. They understand just letting that aggression out. And that's what we try to do with, with wrestling. If you look at a wrestling show, there's probably somebody on that wrestling show that you can relate to. Like, oh, okay, well, he's a hard worker. He's like me. Or this guy's like, well, I'm a giant. He's, I'm like him. Or I would like to be like that guy. Or that guy is fighting somebody that reminds me of my boss. So I want that guy to smash my boss in his head. <laughs> so so it's, 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 it's all these different stories. And people have an opportunity to relate to everything that's going on. And that's kind of the wrestling business. There's just so many different um, ways of trying to explain it, but um, without actually doing it, it's very hard to explain it. Well, that already added value to me, just hearing that, because one thing I know about human beings is we relate to stories, right? The best speakers, yeah. they tell stories. Jesus told mm -hmm. parables in the Bible. I mean, people learn through story. And so now I can immediately imagine like watching you out there. I've watched you on TV a number of times. I can, I can see the story at play and see the different characters and how people would be attracted to those different characters. And uh, I'll mention Absolutely. a buddy of mine. I'm going to throw him in Cody Foster. He's the owner of a founder of advisors, Excel multi-billion dollar financial company. And uh, he loves WWE loves it. Yeah. So uh, I'll send this to Cody. So he's listening to it, but <laughs> I've had some of these conversations and, I told him before, yeah, yeah, me and Bobby wrestled together in college. And he's like, for real? Like Bobby Lashley? Like, yeah. So anyway, yeah, like he's people that are fans are fans, but this has already given me yeah. a deeper insight, man, to it. So, yeah. okay. now that's, you, why, that's why people are addicted. Yeah. You've traveled everywhere. I mean, like I jump on Instagram and I see you on like a camel. I'm like, all right, in, in the Middle East somewhere <laughs> or something. I'm like, what, what's one of the coolest trips that you've been on? Ah. Uh... That oh oh the last one that I did, I had to because I that was a big check off on my bucket list. I did a safari in South Africa, mm. and it, it wasn't like going to a zoo. I mean, I we were out there with the animals, like like to be as close up that I was to this lion. Yeah, like this like I was feeding a lion. I was I, I had a cage with me, but he came all the way up to it and he, he was resting his head up against it. When I looked at that animal, I was like, if I was out there as big as I am, I have zero chance of escaping that animal. If that animal wanted to just rip me apart. Yeah. It was majestic. This like huge. Um, it was just awesome. I, I, I got to pet a cheetah and all these other animals. But that was that was a really cool experience. I always wanted to go to South Africa. Um, I went to Great Barrier Reef in, in Australia off Australia, I've been to New Zealand, um, went to a lot of places. And so I've been, I mean, I've been, I've been kind of everywhere. Like for me, I always tell people I can, I can go backwards. Like if, if you want to know a certain area for a certain reason, then I can tell you that like, as far as artwork for me, I think Italy is like, it's hard to beat. Um, Cause some of the places that I've in Milan and and Rome and some of the artwork and the beauty that they have with the buildings and the architecture is just, it's just, it's, it's breathtaking. Yeah. Um, the, the vibe of New Zealand, going to New Zealand, just, just seeing the, just the, just the very, I, I felt like New Zealand was just like calm. It was a beautiful, beautiful island, beautiful country. It was just so calm there. Um, Japan, I just love Japan because Japan was like a very busy city. It was like it was like a city that just that never turned off. It was like a large New York City. It was like a lot of stuff going on, and there was like culture and and um, in the Japanese culture, there's a tremendous amount of respect. So you saw like the hierarchy and everything, and you just saw like a different culture with the with the Japanese people. And I think that was super super cool. Um, South America is always really cool for me, and Central America, Costa Rica. I loved Costa Rica, Colombia. Um, yeah, I, I, I couldn't pick any one particular place. I've been some, been to probably, 
I've been everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it would be, you know, I love everything. I love everything. But those kind of do stick out, those particular countries. But if if we got into talking a little bit more somewhere else, I would talk about like somewhere in Switzerland or somewhere in, in France or in in Romania or I, I don't know. It's yeah. there's just been so many really cool experiences. With with all that what is still on Bobby Lashley's bucket list? And not just mean travel. It could either be someplace you want to travel or something you want to do, man. And we know I you have a wrestling coach, and I hope you get to go and do that because you're going <laughs> to maximize. What's, what's the big thing on your bucket list? Um, I want to go to – I haven't been to Greece. Um, Santorini, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, I, th- I think it's beautiful. I've seen it in pictures all the time. Um, but of all mine – is like I want to visit all the natural wonders of the world mm. and I've been close to or by almost every one of them and I chose not to go because I didn't want to just go on oh, say we had a wrestling trip and we had a day off and go over there oh cool take some pictures and take off no I want to I want to go to some of those places I want to go see the pyramids I want to see um I want to go climb not climb Kilimanjaro but I want to go to, to different places and I, I want to see all the the naturals of the world and i want to see the all the man-made wonders of the world also yeah i've seen a lot of them but i want to see all of them check them all off the list yeah no i get that i mean even just like do college wrestling it's like you can say you've been to all these places but like you went to the hotel and the gym you didn't have time okay. to really go see so like yeah yes yeah, yep. so those places would be amazing just to really go and see and, and take it all in yeah so, mm-hmm. all right man my last question fast feet all right you got fast feet you're an athlete Yes. You can choose any of these. You can choose one of them. You can speak on them all. It's totally up to you. All right. But I want you to tell us about either a highlight, a hero, or a hardship in your life, and then just expound upon it. Highlight, hero, or hardship. Um, dang. I, I, I don't want to say hero because um i have i have a f- several um from my high school coach coach laster he was i mean he coach laster was like he was an amazing person for me in my life because um when i when i came to high school that's like right after my parents got a divorce i, I got put on varsity um as a freshman I wrestled on 112 and coach laster was one of those guys all the way through high school he would on over the summer, he'd be like, Coach, you want to go to wrestling tournaments in, you know, Wichita. And you no, know, we didn't drive, but coach would always have his car. And if somebody else had theirs, he would drive us to these tournaments, just kind of sit up in the stands all day long. And he was a mentor. He's somebody I talked to. Like in my house, I don't have a single wrestling medal that I have that I've ever earned. Not a wrestling medal, not a plaque, not a trophy, not anything. And I feel bad that I don't have them, but a lot of times when I had those, I would give them away to people that really impacted my life or helped me out in my life. I don't have my ring. I don't have anything. So um, Coach Laster had a lot of it. He was, and then it was Coach Laster. So Laster was just like Lashley. So a lot of people thought that he was like my dad at, so, at times. But it was, um, he was just that guy, man. He just showed that he cared. And he was, one that he, he showed that he cared and, and and he just had like a good energy about him. Like I, I like even to this day when I go back to Jackson City, I go see Coach. Um, he was just a very important person to me, and he was somebody that just made me realize and and helped me become a man. I believe. Remember when he just when I my freshman year, there was something where we didn't have any headgears left, and there was a headgear that we had only for the varsity team, and he was like. Before it even started, he says, I'm going to give this to you. He said, are you going to make varsity? And I said, yes. And I made varsity. And it was like I had to prove myself to him because he gave me this head. It, it, it really meant nothing, but it meant a lot to me. Um, and I can talk all, all day about him. And it has nothing to do. A lot of times, you know, with coaches, it doesn't have to do with what's in the room, the moves that he taught you or anything like that. It just mattered the the stuff that he instilled in me the hard work ethic the drive the desire everything like that it was something that he just kind of like was there for me and i and i always wanted to make him proud um but then even me even even going further you know i'm not taking anything away from college like mockles was 
Marcos is that guy. You know, you know Marcos. Marcos, he was one of the, one of the guys. Like he still, all the guys still talk with him. All the guys still there. Marcos was kind of like um, the guy that you hated when you were in college that you want to just pull his head off. But <laughs> ultimately, um, Marcos wanted to make sure that we were all like good people. Uh, make sure that we went to class, make sure that we got our grades together and then push us and, and checked us when we needed to get checked. And I think um, all along when I was growing up, I needed those kind of mentors. And and Michaels was also one of those mentors that like somebody that like I used to just want to like punch him in his face at times, but <laughs> that's just coach. He was the one that just made you made you tough because he was there for you. Mm-hmm. Um, hardships. Um, I'll tell you one one story, and I'll kind of leave it at this. And this is a story that I don't tell very often. I don't even know if I've told this story. And I don't even remember if Mockles remembers this story. But um, it was my sophomore year at Valley, and it was getting ready. It was before the national championships. And um, I had my roommate was Trimbley at the time, Scott Trimbley. And I remember me and Scotty, we were both like the younger guys on the team, but we were we were doing our thing. So, and we were roommates. So I would get up early in the morning, put my shoes on, I'd get out and run. I was like, I got, I'm, I'm doing more than him because Scott pushed it hard. Oh, yeah. So I was like, I'm doing more than him, <laughs> you know. And then I get back, it's like he's gone and his shoes are gone. I was like, damn it, you know. <laughs> so you know, it was always like that little rivalry between us is of, of wanting to win and be the best and even be the best on the team. So we even had to compete with each other, even though it was different weight classes. Now, fast forward all the way to national championships. Now we're in the championships, and me and Scott are in the finals. And there's so, there's a uh, Miko and and Morgan in the finals, and it was like our team's turning point. It was like we could actually win this tournament. If Bo wins his match, we win the tournament. And Bo was at 118. Bo won it, so we won the tournament. Mm-hmm. Scotty's wrestling Ricky. Dang it, can't remember his last name. Ricky Williams, I think it was. Ricky but Williams. he wrestled him earlier in the year, and he teched Scott. Now Scott had some again in the final, and it li- and it almost appeared that he text Scott fairly easily, because he was bad. Um, I remember I was sitting by the bleachers with Scott before he went out. You know they do the whole you walk out, spotlight over the mat, everything's dark, and I, and I turned to Scott. Me and Scott never we we weren't like emotional type people, you know. And I looked at Scott and I just looked at him and I was like, "Are you nervous?" I said, "Are you scared?" He goes. He looked at me and he was just like, because if he, because if he said no, he was lying and I was terrified. Yeah. I was wrestling a guy that was 64 and one that year and we're both sophomores and we're at Valley, just like scrappy sophomores. <clears throat> Scott goes out there and wrestles probably one of the toughest matches that I've seen him wrestle. I mean, Scott gave him everything. And Scott barely lost that match. Man, it, it like just ripped my heart out, ripped him out. And I remember Scott kind of like pushed his way through the crowd a little bit. And he came and gave me a hug. He said, go get him. Or he said something. And I was like, ah. <laughs> now I'm like way more scared at this point. Now, I grew up, lived with my mom. And my mom didn't have an opportunity to come to anything that I've ever done in wrestling. I mean, we just didn't have the money to. So I never put it on her. So I used to always just bust my butt. And I never used to like let her know of what was going on. And I went over to Michaels and I said, Michaels, I need to call my mom. Like we didn't have normal cell phones at that time. And Michaels was like, what? He goes, all right, all right. So we go running. Me and Michaels were running in the arena and we're trying to find somewhere where I can call home. Boom, boom. I, we find this office up at the top and I call my mom and I'm like, mom. Um, she goes, hey, Bobby, what's going on? I'm, I'm getting ready for work. What are you doing? What are you doing? I said, I said, not mom. I'm just, just, are you, what are you doing right now? She goes, I'm getting ready for work. She, I said, I'm gonna call you back. She goes, hurry up. What are you doing? Why, why? And she said, all right. So I, boom, and Michael's like, they're calling you. They're calling you. We got to get downstairs. We go running downstairs. I get there and then I walk out and we have the match. And I ended up beating this guy 10 to 2. Never seen the match before. I don't remember a single part of that match at all whatsoever. After the match is over, you know, I turn to the crowd. The crowd's going all crazy. And I just fall into the crowd. And 
it was it was nuts but i i said i got i gotta go call my mom so we go rushing through and we get up there and we get to the room and law and call my mom and mom was like what's going on what's going on and i and i had the phone in my hand and i'm sitting there and i'm squeezing it and i just keep squeezing it harder and harder and harder and i can't even say the words i won nationals yeah i was like Argh. Michael's ends up taking the phone he says miss lash you got to be proud of your son he just won nationals she didn't even know where i was yeah what i was doing anything and she started crying and passed me the phone and like i love you so much and it just like <sighs> to me it was it was it was impactful because um just growing up rough it was hard because you didn't have the opportunity to see your parents or your mom happy and the tears of tears were always tears of pain yeah this time it was different so it was it was a it was a hard point in my life to be able to do that but um i think that's what kind of drove me throughout my athletic career um, there was people that were there in my life that I just wanted to kind of make them happy, make them proud by, by my, my achievements. So I think that's why I just trained as hard as I could. Yeah. And what's funny is even to this day, being a grown man, 20 something years later, um, of course, she knows I won and, and we've already talked about it, but I've never been able to just say those words that I had such a hard time saying at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I used to always say that um, that was kind of my drive with everything. If you ask me what my drive was, my drive was is to, is to bring happiness to the people that were around me. And I always used to watch wrestling matches. And when I would win, I would turn to the crowd and I would see like my friends and family and coaches and, 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 and my teammates they're smiling and jumping up and, and that was my way of giving joy to them. Yeah. And that's why I don't have any like medals or anything. It wasn't like a selfish thing. It wasn't like I need this big medal so that I can be or anything like that. I've never been like that. Yeah. And even to this day, I think I've made it to a certain point in my life and I've never been like, Oh, let me look at me. Look what I can do. Mm -hmm. um, it's always been like, I wanted to give joy to so many other people. So that's why I continue using myself as a tool and I bust my butt and I work as hard as I can so that I can put smiles on faces of my friends, my family, um, anybody else that ever supported anything that I did. So that was my motivation. Love it, man. That's a, that's a powerful story. Got, got me on the inside a little bit right there, man, but that's a powerful <laughs> story. And there's nothing better. I mean, there's really not, like you said, whenever you win or something, you look over and you see the people that matter to you when they're cheering and they're, dude, that's like one of the best feelings in the world, man. But to do it yeah. for your mom. And I know that you make your mom proud. Um, you make yeah. everybody in JC and in Kansas and, you know, period proud, all of us mobile guys. And anyway, so thanks for sharing your time, Bobby, man. I appreciate it. I know your time yeah. is valuable. Um, where can we find you on social media? How do we, how do we follow you in your journey? Um, I like Instagram. I don't, I don't post much on Instagram, but, um, Instagram kind of, it, it gives me a little small glimpse of my life, of course on Facebook, uh, but, um, Instagram fight Bobby on, on Twitter, but Instagram is where I like to like to kind of stay and, and Instagram. I try to, I try to, I reconnect with some of the people that I've, um, lost contact with. So, uh, if you, if you're on there, send me a, a message and it, just kind of reconnects me with some people because then I, I get so busy in my life that uh, I look back at some of the people that like, like us, you know, some of my friends that I had in college and stuff like that, that it, it's important to me to be able to reconnect with them. So Instagram is probably the best way and the easiest way that I can do that. All right. So I'll make sure I put the Instagram link and Twitter link. I'll put all those things in the show notes, but again, man, I appreciate you being on. This was 
it was good. I love your passion and it was valuable, man. People are going to gain a lot of value out of this. And you're also a great storyteller. I don't know if you know that, maybe you do know that, but you're a great storyteller. And uh, so this was, this was super engaging. I appreciate it. Man, anytime, anytime. Absolutely. So, all right. For everybody listening, man, this has been WWE superstar, Bobby Lashley, another episode of coach P's perspective and may God bless you and shine his face upon you and give you peace till next time we're out.